My name is Radley Horton, and I'd like to welcome everybody to the workshop on correlated uh, extreme events. It's thrilled to see all of you here uh, for our kickoff uh, evening panel before we delve into the next two and a half days, Wednesday, Thursday, um, and half of Friday. And looking around the room, uh, it's really exciting to see um, the diversity of faces, diversity of parts of the world represented, a um, number of young scholars, um, also the sort of blend of scientist, uh, policymaker, sectoral expertise that we've really strived to, to, to achieve, I think, with this, with this event. And we're just thrilled um, for, the, for the discussions that we're going to be having um, over the next, next few days. Um, before we jump in, I want to quickly take a moment to acknowledge our sponsors, um, which you can see scattered around this very um, busy slide. I won't call out all these names, but I want to especially highlight uh, the Initiative on Extreme Weather uh, and Climate um, under Adam Sobel and Susanna Camargo's leadership, provided the seed funding uh, roughly a year ago uh, when Colin and I first started to have the idea for convening this workshop. And along the way, we're instrumental in so many ways, including uh, getting us this, this fantastic venue. So, so special thanks um, there. Um, there's you know, one person who deserves even more thanks uh, than that. And I want to, at this time, invite Colin Raymond up um, for a moment as well. Most of you, I think, have probably interacted with, with Colin at some point um, in the last year or so, which is a testament to how he has owned every aspect of the logistics of this event, um, but also what may not be as apparent the central role that he played um, in developing the sort of concept structure um, of, this, of this workshop as is going to be clear um, as we work together over the next few days. So coming up for a second, uh, Colin. Um, well, I don't know what to add to that exactly, uh, how to follow that comment, but um, thank you, Radley, for supporting this. And um, it was really our, our brainchild and as Riley said, it's very exciting to see so many leading minds up here gathered from really around the world, you know, Eastern Hemisphere, Western Hemisphere, Northern Hemisphere, Southern Hemisphere, um, about these, these events with global implications, you know, illustrated with these four kind of characteristic um, types of extreme events that can be um, analyzed with a correlational framework. So we're hoping to discuss all four types of events illustrated here, you know, and more and kind of move the workshop, uh, through the workshop, move toward uh, future steps to analyze them in ways that are um, kind of productive for building more climate knowledge as well as um, knowledge that's, that's directly uh, actionable in terms of impacts in policy. So looking forward to the discussions and uh, we'll turn it over to Radley for um, a brief introduction to some of the themes that we'll be talking about. Um, in terms of events and, and, and uh, types of correlation, the, con the concept of correlation itself, and then we'll move into the panel. So, looking forward to it. Yeah, so I'm gonna work to just sort of quickly frame uh, the workshop for us and then get out of the way, um, because I think we're gonna have a really exciting uh, discussion where we really get a chance to hear from uh, experts across the science um, and policy interface uh, giving us some specific examples of how they've worked on extreme events and looked at the impacts and policy implications um, of thinking about extreme events specifically and how that maybe can serve a bridge to some of the more frontier thinking uh, going on in the context of correlated extreme events. So with that, I think it's time to uh, quickly dig a little more deeply into what we mean by correlated ex or compound um, extreme events. Um, and obviously we'll have a lot more time um, to delve much more deeply into these topics over the next few days. But you know, the first thing to highlight here, you know, when we talk about correlated or compound, essentially it's just the simple notion of more than one, right? So if we look about three possible framings for correlated extremes, we can think about multivariate, it's probably gotten the most attention so far, the idea of more than one variable having an impact at a particular place at a particular time. But some of the dimensions that you can also find in the literature, but maybe not to the same extent, which I think we're really going to have an opportunity to bring to the fore with sessions devoted to, to these other themes, concurrence. The idea that at one moment in time, or maybe it's one season in time or one year, uh, we may see 
patterns that lead to simultaneous extremes of the same or different type across different parts um, of the planet. Um, and similar to this notion of sequential, that for any one place, we need to think not just about an event at one time, but the same or multiple events in succession. With climate change especially, are we maybe underestimating how quickly some of the probabilities of different types of correlated extremes could shift in the future? And maybe even more to the point, as we'll discuss, are there nonlinearities on the impact side as we start to add correlation uh, that we need to think about? If so, how do we begin to engage on the policy discussions as we're thinking about everything from sort of legal uh, attribution aspects to sort of basic questions facing planners as they think about long-term adaptation? If you're thinking in a sort of correlated extremes context, uh, does it suggest different adaptation strategies? That's another example of something we'll have a chance to, to talk about. So you know, this is probably obvious, but just to maybe anchor uh, some of the folks from, from further away, example of what's maybe sort of principally a multivariate extreme as we're thinking about here, combinations of high temperatures and low precipitation that increase the risk um, of the types of fires, such as the Wolseley Fire uh, here from Malibu last year. This led to the evacuation of 300,000 people um, in Southern California. You see here, iconic beaches in Malibu. Uh, deaths, um, over 1,600 structures, I believe, destroyed by this fire. Um, not the worst of the fires that California faced um, last year. Climate is one piece, correlated extremes is one piece. Uh, obviously, there are other pieces outside the climate sphere that we'll be looking to disentangle uh, as well, including, for example, how air quality, human health is affected when we have these types of, uh, of extreme events, and also some of the kind of policy decisions that may have increased um, some of these risks, people moving more into fire-prone areas, forest management decisions, for, for example. Concurrent extremes, um, a paper here that we're going to see a presentation on um, from Kai in the coming days. Getting at this idea, this is showing you um, in early July of 2018, a signature across the northern hemisphere of a planetary wave pattern associated with these temperature anomalies that you see um, on the left, red for anomalously high temperatures. Um, and you can basically see the, the vertical wind patterns with a sort of standing wave uh, signature on the right. We'll hear more about that um, and start to think about, are these risks changing with climate change? Have we also maybe underestimated some of these kind of correlated risks independent of climate change? If so, are there potential nonlinearities I mentioned as we think about things like food security, um, risk of conflict, topics that we'll be discussing over the coming days? An example of sequential extremes, um, uh, even more recent. What you can see here in the top left panel uh, precipitation anomalies so far in 2019, if we could hone in on the southeast U.S., identifying some of those places um, shown in purple, where you've had 50 centimeter uh, or more uh, precipitation anomalies, suggesting this sort of locking into a pattern where for any given place, a greater than normal probability of a sort of sequence um, of heavy rain uh, events. Having impacts, as we're going to hear more uh, tomorrow from one of our morning keynotes, quite possibly leading uh, for the third time, only the third time this century, to the opening of the Morganzana uh, spillway on the Mississippi River. So these events um, are having impacts and, 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 and as we think about planning. Okay, so let's step back just a little bit now, some of the historical context, very briefly, um, in thinking about uh, correlated extremes. I think the most important thing to highlight, uh, which is you know, probably obvious, is that this is not a new idea fundamentally. Um, this is, you know, maybe arguably one of the most iconic figures describing Encel and its teleconnections from 1989. If we think about some of the work of Mickey Glantz, for example, um, from the 90s, if I recall correctly, thinking about some of these correlated patterns associated with Encel and how decision makers thinking about food security, thinking about commodities prices, could leverage some of these existing known correlation uh, structures around the globe. So not a new notion, but I think, you know, in the context of climate change um, and deeper sort of impacts analysis as we think more about extremes, a lot to learn um, and a lot further to, to advance things. So they're the quickest uh, of overviews. Those of you who've done a lot of work in this correlated extreme space will notice the simplicity of what we summarize here and certainly no time to talk about a lot of the specific contributions you have made um, through individual studies. Instead, we sort of highlight 
some sort of assessment and review article uh, findings in the compound or correlated extreme space. So the first time that the IPCC, to my knowledge, referenced um, compound or correlated extremes was in the SREX, SREX report of 2012. You can see here the various um, dimensions to that, to that definition. More recently, um, we see this notion of multiple causes um, behind uh, correlated extremes uh, as, we, as we sort of see a deeper exploration of what can lead to these types of events. Framing around risk assessments. So we're not just thinking about the probabilities from the climate space, but fundamental, fundamentally starting to think about where the societal vulnerabilities might be the greatest, where we need to think about the potential for the largest consequences, even for some outcomes where the, where the probabilities might be relatively low, arguing for the kind of bottom-up approach, engaging with the sector experts, the policymakers who can offer that guidance about which types of correlated extremes, which patterns are going to be the most impactful for society, and also probably point out some additional correlations, complexity that we haven't thought about extending to the policy space. You know, as one example, you know, from here in New York City, just to show how these things can play out. When we have a heat wave in New York, we also tend to have low air quality, poor air quality. Um, these are obviously the times when um, it's most likely that the air conditioning is going to fail, that we're not going to have cooling for our vulnerable populations precisely when they need it the most. Adding an additional policy dimension here, those are the times when New York City is most likely to turn on these very polluting diesel um, energy sources to try to meet that extra supply which feeds back um, through additional air pollution. So you start to see some of the complexities um, of these correlations and associated vulnerabilities that we want to further, further illuminate uh, through this workshop. And then another um, review article um, also um, uh, led by, by folks from the steering committee for this event, beginning to think about some of the cascading impacts of correlated extremes, referencing of other environmental crises um, that, that can maybe be be started in a kind of chain reaction uh, through some of these types of, uh, of correlation. Okay, so as we sort of shift back now to this workshop, some of the things we want to do, I think as I mentioned earlier, going deeper into the compact, into the um, one moment in time, multiple regions, the sort of concurrent uh, correlated extremes, and also moving that sequential dimension a little further um, than in prior, prior research, and really putting into practice this notion of the need for the bottom-up approaches driven by the sector experts, by the policy folks, to help inform this otherwise really sort of infinite universe of correlation um, that the climate scientists could turn to without um, sort of guidance uh, from the people who can tell us where, where the needs um, are the greatest. So overall objectives, the first one, um, since we are over 50% um, climate scientists in this workshop, expanding communication across the types of extreme events that we're looking at. What are some of the methodologies that we can share? What are some ways that if we think a little more broadly about the phenomenon we study, we may be able to see ways to collaborate within that sort of climate scientist uh, space. And I think the more exciting, maybe more novel piece um, is the second objective here, building those deeper relationships um, between the sort of top-down approaches, hazard description, probability assessments, uh, with these sort of bottom-up sector uh, risk management um, driven, driven components. Um, you know, we're, we're really excited to, to advance that work. Also, you know, I want to say a little bit at the beginning, I think we'll, we'll have a chance over the coming days to have this evolve, but some of the tangible outcomes that I think can come out of this, um, thinking about ways that we can engage more fully with existing um, organizations. Are there things that the Army Corps of Engineers um, can, can engage in some of their existing practices that they may, for example, hear about at, at this workshop is one example. How can we not only respond through proposals um, uh, to sort of you know, new ideas, but how can we work to kind of shape some of those um, funding streams to sort of push the envelope by identifying this sort of confluence, this interface where the societal needs are great, and we think the potentials for, for scientific advance um, uh, is really high. And then, you know, the, what are sometimes referred to as the three, the three Ps, the proposals, the publications, and, and future presentations that these kind of workshops can help, um, uh, help foster. Um, very quickly, just a few of the really obvious cross-cutting themes, I think, um, to highlight the sensitivity um, of correlated extremes to even small shifts in climate, right? This notion that just a little bit of sea level rise, for example, can in fundamental ways change the probability of coastal flooding associated with a surge 
and associated with heavy rain events. It can be these sort of nonlinear shifts in the climate hazards. Um, I think another takeaway that we're going to have is that the, when we look across all the presentations, all the posters that you're going to see over the coming days, we see such a diverse set of methods being applied here. We're going to see paleo perspectives. We're going to see detection and attribution applied um, in this sort of correlated impact space. Um, you know, a variety of methods that I think um, in storyline, you know, very quantitative approaches right through to more qualitative sort of storyline uh, scenario approaches for thinking about these risks. And I think, I think that'll be an exciting uh, way to expand collaborations uh, as well. The diversity uh, of impacts that you're going to hear about. We're going to hear from folks uh, working on crop yields, food security, dam experts, you know, who have to think about, you know, correlation, um, uh, spatial links across uh, river systems, people doing long-term uh, engineering planning, people thinking about conflict, people thinking about human health, uh, mortality outcomes of, of correlated extremes. The list goes on and on. Uh, we're really excited to hear um, uh, those, those diverse perspectives captured. Um, but I think, you know, getting towards this point again about the nonlinear responses on the impact side to these shifts in mean conditions is, you know, something that we need to highlight. And, you know, we don't want to give the impression that everything is going to be dire. I mean, to be sure, as we look at some types of correlated extremes, some of these hazards probably back off a little bit once we think um, in, in compound space. But there are going to be a lot of others that, that don't. Um, and as we think about the framing, for example, from the last U.S. National Climate Assessment, for the first time, that report included a chapter on essentially surprises. And in the framing of that chapter, really it was twofold. It was the notion of sort of, on the one hand, tipping points, things that our existing frameworks like climate models aren't very good at capturing, some of those tail, tail risks of positive feedbacks. But the other thing brought front and center was this notion of underappreciated um, correlation. So I think this is sort of an obvious bridge um, as we think a little more about dimensions that may veer a little bit towards advocacy thinking about notions of urgency and the role as we advance our understanding of correlated extremes um, and thinking about the sort of possible futures that may already be beginning to emerge and then emerge with just one and a half degree uh, or two degrees of warming, right? So a lot of folks are probably familiar with, with this figure um, from a couple of years ago. Just to sort of hone in on one example, if we think about Arctic sea ice where, you know, if anything, this figure probably underestimates you know, the risk that we could have an ice-free uh, summer in the Arctic, um, you know, any year very soon. What do we know about sort of correlated extremes, you know, for that type of context? What happens to the Greenland ice sheet and our sort of tail scenarios of sea level rise if you suddenly remove um, all that Arctic sea ice? What does it mean for the jet stream? What does it mean for ocean circulation? A lot of unknowns, but I think, you know, as we start to build narratives in this correlated space, it's not difficult at all to see um, how a lot of these systems, you know, could be a lot more vulnerable than we might otherwise think. And I think that opens the door. It's frightening, but it also opens the door to some potential for engaging um, in new ways, uh, communicating about hazards, um, and really thinking about sort of new opportunities uh, to reach people, thinking about um, uh, some, of these, some of these challenges that we face. Um, you know, here just an example of, of 2017, one moment in time, uh, three major hurricanes in the Atlantic. This is right simultaneously a multivariate risk, surge and heavy rain and wind and you name it. It's sequential for any one place as we think about the risk, you know, as we get out into the future of maybe large scale um, uh, flood insurance failures um, in, in the U.S. There are outcomes out there that, that may not be as far away as we could otherwise um, think. And so we're really excited sort of wearing the Columbia hat here for a moment to bring together the scientists, but also to bring, bring together so many other aspects of society, members of the insurance community, business, uh, legal, to really think about some of these you know, possibilities and some of, these, some of these topics where the science is advancing rapidly and our understanding of, of the, the sort of societal challenges and opportunities uh, is as well. As we think about these types of, of risks, it leads to a plug for another conference that we're going to be convening here at Columbia next month, also as part of this adaptation initiative that's working in an interdisciplinary way um, to take on some of these sort of big challenges around climate hazards. Um, 
the basic you know you know plug is sort of included here this is you know the first major event in the world on managed retreat we're going to be engaging all the questions about how does climate science inform where the vulnerabilities are the greatest um, where should people move to who decides what's the role of the law on these things how do we make sure that the most vulnerable members of communities aren't left behind with the least access uh, to information um, so that's uh, another event that will be coming up next month that I think is going to explore a lot of these themes as we think more and more about things that might have seemed implausible in the past, gradually making their way onto the radar, gradually at first, but potentially very quickly um, in terms of some of the, some of the possible uh, tipping points of societal uh, response. Um, so with that, I'm going to stop talking um, and turn things over to um, this fantastic panel that we've assembled. I'm going to introduce Kate Marvel uh, to moderate the event. I'm sure a lot of you, um, most of you are familiar uh, with, Kate's, with Kate's work. She's a research scientist at Columbia and at the NASA Goddard Institute for Space Studies. In her research, she uses computer models and satellite observations to monitor and explain the changes happening around us. Her scientific work has shown that human activities are already influencing global rainfall, drought risk, and cloud patterns. Kate has given public talks in environments as diverse as comedy clubs, uh, elementary schools, prisons, and the TED conference uh, main stage, US Congress um, last week uh, as well, I might add. Her essays have appeared um, in Nautilus uh, magazine, Scientific American, um, uh, and On Being, to name just a few. So with that, let's welcome uh, Kate Marvel to, to start our panel. All right. Well, thank you so much for being here. I'm excited to see this, this great crowd. Um, I don't have to do much tonight except introduce the really fantastic people we have on this panel and ask them a bunch of questions. Um, so what I want to do right now is kind of give you a taste of who you're going to hear from tonight, and then I'll let them come up and give their presentations, and then we will sit down and I will ask them a bunch of questions, and then I will let you ask them a bunch of questions. Um, so our first speaker is Sarah Perkins Kirkpatrick. She is a senior lecturer and an ARC Future Fellow at the Climate Change Research Center at the University of New South Wales, Sydney, where she's also affiliated with the Center of Excellence for Climate Extreme. Dreams. Her main research interest is heat waves, how to measure them, what drives them, how they have changed, and the role of anthropogenic climate change behind these changes. She is also interested in the health impacts of heat waves and how these may be driven by anthropogenic climate change. Over the last decade, Sarah has authored and co-authored over 60 peer-reviewed journal articles, as well as numerous reports and book chapters and climate extremes. And Importantly, she's also a really active communicator in the Australian and global media because she is very brave, focusing on the topics of heat wave and general climate change. So really excited to have her here. Um, our second panelist is Michael Oppenheimer, who is the Albert G. Milbank Professor of Geosciences and International Affairs in the Woodrow Wilson School, the Department of Geosciences, and the Princeton Environmental Institute at Princeton University. So he's basically the professor of everything. Um, he is the director of the Center for Policy Research on Energy and the Environment at the Woodrow Wilson School. And he joined the Princeton faculty after more than two decades with the Environmental Defense Fund. Um, he's the author of over 180 articles and is co-author of a 1990 book, Dead Heat, colon, The Race Against the Greenhouse Effect. Are we, are we winning that? Lost. Yeah, we lost. <laughs> all right, all right. Bummer. Um, and co-author of the book, Discerning Experts, The Practices of Scientific Assessment for Environmental Policy, published earlier this year. He is a longtime participant in the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change that won the Nobel Peace Prize in 2007, and his interests include science and policy of the atmosphere, particularly climate change, the risks and impacts climate change entails, and adaptation and other human responses. Really germane to this event, his research aims to understand the potential for dangerous outcomes of increasing levels of greenhouse gases by exploring the effects of global warming on the ice sheets and sea level, on the risk from coastal storms, and on patterns of human migration. He also studies the process of scientific learning and scientific assessments and their role in understanding problems of global change. Um, our third panelist um, is um, amazing for many reasons, but not least because he stepped in at the very last minute. 
Um, so Adam Sobel is a professor here at Columbia uh, at Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory and the Foo Foundation School of Engineering and Applied Sciences. He's an atmospheric scientist who specializes in the dynamics of climate and weather, particularly in the tropics on timescales of days to decades. A major focus of his current research is extreme events such as hurricanes, tornadoes, floods, and droughts, and the risks these pose to human society in the present and future climate. He leads the Columbia University Initiative on Extreme Weather and Climate. He holds a PhD in meteorology from MIT, and in the last few years, he received a bunch of awards, a <laughs> lot of them. Um, oh, he's the, um, he's the author or co-author of a, a bunch of scientific articles, and his book about Hurricane Sandy, Storm Surge, published in October 2014 by HarperCollins, received the 2014 Atmospheric Science Librarian's International Choice Award in the popular category, and you should probably order it on Amazon right now if you haven't done so. Um, so with that, I would love to turn it over to Sarah, who's going to come up and tell us a little bit about what she does. Thanks for having me. Um, I'd like to start off by in particular thanking Colin and Radley for organising this workshop and inviting me all the way from Australia. Um, so over the next few minutes, I think I have maybe seven minutes to talk about extreme heat, which is what I study, uh, more or less heat waves. Oops, it's not the end. Let's go back this way. So something that I've spent a lot of time working on is the definition of a heat wave. And that work really amounted to one very general definition, which is a prolonged period of excessive heat. This is because heat waves apply to many different sectors, whether you're a climate scientist or work in impacts or human health. So I personally believe that we're never really going to get to that universal definition. But some things that we do need to consider when we're talking about heat waves or extreme heat is what defines prolonged? Is this a couple of days or a month? What defines excessive? So what's our extreme threshold? Why do we really care? Are we a climate scientist? Are we a health impacts researcher? Are we both? And what else should we consider? Is it just the impacts or the science or something else? So these figures are showing just a few examples of different measures of heat waves. Uh, the first is a heat wave duration index. This was sort of the first heat wave definition that ever existed. It was, re it was quite premature, um, but it's gone on to influence other definitions such as uh, the, the definition we use in Australia for forecasting. Uh, this is based on a slightly more complex um, uh, threshold over at least three days, and it's also ranked in its severity, which is the different colours. We also have other def definitions by Fisher and Shah, which look at the intensity and also separately the frequency and duration of events. And lastly, a definition by Russo et al. that actually allows us to compare the, extreme, the extremity of heat waves as well as their duration um, across the globe, not just uh, focusing on one or two events. So how do we get heat waves? This is basically about three or four lectures summarised into one slide. This is just looking at their physical um, drivers, if you will. Um, and these can go on to influence correlated extremes as well. Firstly, there's interactions with dry soil, including drought, where there's a difference in the partitioning of the latent and sensible heat flux. So during normal conditions over relatively moist soil, we see the energy go into the evaporation of, of that moisture from that soil. In drought conditions, or when it's much drier, um, that energy goes into the sensible heat flux, and we see the heat wave conditions um, continue or exacerbated. We also see persistent high pressure systems. Uh, in the Northern Hemisphere, these are mainly uh, official blocking systems. When qu not quite uh, further south in Australia or far south enough in Australia to call them official blocking si systems, which is why I call them persistent highs. Um, but these usually sit adjacent to the area affected and evict that warm air into the, the heat wave. So the two examples I've got there is from a paper by um, Neil and Taboldi uh, in 2004. This is actually showing how far the um, that high pressure system goes into the vertical column of the atmosphere. So it's not just at the surface. A third main physical driver is uh, warmer conditions due to background um, natural variability. Particularly in Australia, we're heavily influenced by ENSO, and we tend to get much more heat waves um, over the southern eastern parts of the continent uh, when we're in the El Nino phase. And that's related back to the drought um, and dry soil conditions as well. So these mechanisms interact and are correlated. Uh, so in particular, when we see the, those high pressure systems uh, ac accumulate the heat over, over the area affected, they not only entrain heat and let that heat wave progress for longer, they also exacerbate the dry conditions itself. So it's kind of like this feedback system and um, is, can be a bit of a chicken and an egg cause as well. Um, particularly over Australia, we've also seen that not only do we get heat waves over particular synoptic patterns, but in this particular case shown in this figure, 
the heat waves are eight times more likely when we have that particular synoptic system and uh, dry soil conditions combined. So they exacerbate each other. We still get heat waves sometimes in that high pressure system, but they're much more likely when conditions are very dry. So fourthly, climate change also plays a role. Uh, we, we only really need a small change in average temperature, uh, which induces disastrous changes for extremes. And I know a lot of the climate scientists here are very familiar with this, so I've put this slide in mainly for those who are outside the climate field. Um, this is additional into the mechanisms uh, previously discussed. So heat waves have occurred, they always will occur, but they're exacerbated by climate change. Uh, this relationship between average temperature and extremes is very sensitive, and I have had um, members outside of climate science and impacts ask me, how can I explain this to the lay audience who isn't used, used to seeing these PDFs here? So the best example I could think of is my two-year-old toddler at home in bath time. She usually loves her baths. It's a very, very simple environment. It's um, very undisturbed, but as soon as you take her out of that natural environment and is disturbed, she loses the plot. No one likes to hear it, no one likes this extreme reaction, but it's guaranteed and it happens every single time. And this is the same as the relationship between shifts in average temperature and seeing a higher frequency of extremes that are also hotter as well. We can identify the human signal behind heat waves. So this comes into the de detection attribution theme. There's a lot of work behind this. Basically, any heat waves that you perform detection attribution on, you will get a climate signal. Or you will get a signal due to anthropogenic climate change. However, it depends, the exact amount of that signal depends on the event that you're looking at. It also depends on what methods exactly you use to detect that signal. So example I have here, I'm sorry, I'm always going back to Australian examples. Um, if we look at the angry summer, which occurred over Australia in 2013, or may, it may actually have been overtaken by the most recent summer, but in any case, this event was defined over a seasonal average temperature uh, over December to February, and it was found to be five times more likely due to climate change using the CMIT-5 models. Um, in a study I did a couple of years later looking at a heat wave that occurred in May, which is actually our fall, it was a heat wave that lasted for three weeks um, and it was actually found to be 24 times more likely due to climate change. So that reiterates that there's always, we almost always find this human signal, but it's different depending on the event that you're looking at. We actually are seeing some events are now being reported as not possible without human influence. That's particularly true for most extreme, or some extreme heat events. And we're actually starting to isolate the influence of um, man-made climate change behind the health impacts of heat waves. So this was uh, first put forward in a paper a few years ago by Dan Mitchell, uh, looking at the health impacts of the 2003 European heat wave and how many extra deaths in Paris and France were caused by the climate change signal of that particular heat wave. So heat waves exacerbate other extremes, whether they're correlated or sequential. Uh, two good examples are wildfires, or we call them bushfires in Australia, and also uh, droughts themselves. So these, the two figures in the middle, the first is showing, the top is showing uh, how the fire season has lengthened uh, over the globe since 1980. So almost everywhere, or th there's a steady trend in there, but we're actually seeing now in Australia that our fire season is actually um, overlapping the fire season here in Northern America, and that's what happened uh, when the Californian fires were burning last year. The bottom figure in the middle is also showing uh, the amount of area that is affected by these wildfires. And there's a steady trend, of course, there's interseasonal variability, but there's a steady trend there as well towards the increase. Uh, another study is looking, the, the study on the right is showing the, the uh, change in flash droughts over China. So this is just an example that I've extracted. There are many other examples across the world where we're seeing this increase in the flash droughts. And a, a flash drought is a, except, a, 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 essentially a short, sharp drought. So something that occurs is very intense and it occurs very quickly. So there's quite, quite a lot of interaction there with heat waves when they can dry out those soil conditions much more quickly because it's a lot hotter. Heat waves also directly impact human health. Radley touched on this uh, in his presentation, uh, both in terms of their intensity and also their interactions with heat waves. Oh, sorry, not heat waves, <laughs> uh, with, with humidity. So the more humid it is, the hotter it feels to, to the average person. The less, uh, the less able we are to cool down by our evaporation through sweating. So this was uh, a, a particular problem during the Chicago heat wave in 1995, and it's also a problem that we'll see further into the future. Uh, the bottom figures uh, looking at um, the globe are showing that once, as the apparent temperature goes up relative to the different global warming thresholds, um, a lot more of the world's going to be affected by this, this apparent temperature. It's going to be hotter and more humid as well. Uh, the study on the bottom right um, also demonstrates that perhaps by the end of this century, uh, the, ability, the, the habitability of um, the Middle East 
will be questionable because of the interactions between both extreme heat um, and humidity as well. So I'll just finish on this slide that the amount of global warming matters when it comes to heat waves. Regardless of the amount of global warming we will experience now, we will certainly see an increase in the intensity, frequency and duration of heat waves. This, these two figures are just showing that their frequency and, and their intensity. However, the amount of global warming matters in the sense that if we can limit the amount of global warming, we will limit these drastic changes in heat waves. So these, although that the changes per global region are, um, are, are different, so we will see larger increases over tropical regions, certainly in the frequency compared to a high latitude reason, regions, there, there is this relationship that if we can cut global warming at you know, maybe even two degrees if we're lucky, um, the, the changes in heat waves will be much less and we have a better, better, better chance to adapt to these changes as well. So I'll leave my presentation there. Uh, the first time that I uh, thought about compound or uh, correlated events was when I was an author on uh, the um, 2012 uh, IPCC report on managing the risks of extreme events and disasters for climate change adaptation. That was the title. It's a compound title, you might say. Uh, and it gives you a hint as to why IPCC isn't always so good at communicating. Um, in that report, which laid out, as I think Radley said, a very clear definition for what uh, compound or correlated events are, it was notable still that the focus was all on the physical context. And we've had uh, two really good presentations here, uh, which sort of outline for us, both from a definition point of view and what the effects of these events are and why they're related and the different mechanisms that could relate them. Uh, it's all been from a physical point of view. And by the way, uh, notably, you made the point about thresholds and nonlinearity. Well, uh, combine that a little bit with uh, what Sarah said. The thresholds that Sarah pointed to were virtually all arbitrary. They're not impact driven. That's true in the heat domain. It's true in the sea level domain. I mean, this thing about extreme sea levels, extreme events, the 100 year event, you know, it's in law. But it's not really connected in any direct way that I know of to any physical outcome. So you have to ask yourself, when you look at that, the so-called nonlinearity comes from going over a threshold. But if the threshold really isn't meaningful in terms of impacts, then there's no real meaningful nonlinearity there. It's just a caution that we have to worry about. Um, so I started looking at this more from the point of view of impact. And my major point here is you have to look at it, you don't have to, you don't have to do anything, that it would be fruitful to look at impacts, look at uh, compound events through the lens of impacts in trying to define what a compound event is, because you wind up with an additional, not necessarily different, but an additional set of events to look at. I first uh, started thinking about this uh, the same year that the, uh, uh, IPCC report I just uh, talked about came out uh, was the year that Hurricane Sandy struck New York City, 2012. And uh, I've told this story before, but it has a new twist on it. A friend of mine has a house on Fire Island. The house was protected by a set of dunes. When Hurricane Sandy came along, the dunes protected his house from getting flooded. The dunes were stripped away by the hurricane, however. The next week, it was a pretty good-sized nor'easter. Um, it might not have done very much damage, except it came in the wake of Hurricane Sandy. For my friend, the dunes were gone, so the flood came in and messed up his house. So it turned into a personal disaster, made a great story. Uh, I said, wow, that's what a compound event is from an impacts point of view. Of course, uh, as I found out a couple of weeks ago, the story is totally apocryphal. Either he told it wrong or I got it wrong. Uh, but his house was never flooded. But still, they, you know, <laughs> good ideas can come from, you know, bogus stories. Um, so what, I, what occurred to me thereafter is like, so these dunes are totally phony too, just like the story. 
uh, they were put there or maintained, probably were there originally in some sense, but they were maintained there by the Army Corps of Engineers and millions and millions of dollars of restoring them continually. And the house wouldn't be there if the dunes weren't there in the first place. And if the house were there, it would have been taken away. If the house were there but the dunes weren't, the house would have been flooded and probably taken away by Hurricane Sandy. And so the second event really would have meant nothing. So the whole um, construct of this compound event was really about something that had to do with the human system, the social system, which defined the event, not all the physical science, or not entirely the physical science. So I just want us to keep a, an eye on the ball that there, there's a lot about compound events which we miss if we only look at them through a physical science lens. So we began to consi consider this, and Radley was part of an early meeting we had. I worked uh, with Jane Baldwin, who's over there, who I hope you'll speak to with later, and Gabe Vecchi. And we started looking at the issue of compound events and how they'll change in the future. And we wanted to start with something simple, relatively. So we started with heat waves. And we started asking the question, which Jane will talk about more tomorrow. Tomorrow? Is that right? Thursday, so I don't want to take steel or thunder, but I will a little bit, which is to look at what difference does it make if you have a heat wave, which is, say, three days, and by the standard definition, uh, whatever your local standard definition is, because there's a million of them, as you just heard, and then you have a break of a couple of days, and then you have, say, another three days' worth of extreme heat. Um, so, you know, the question was, what does it matter if, a heat, if heat comes at you as a bunch of these compound heat waves, rather than, say, you know, just the heat wave here, and then the heat wave there, does it matter? Is there any memory by the time the second heat wave comes along a few days later of what happened in the first heat wave? That was the key question. So it, it really is a question of whether the systems that respond to the heat waves protect themselves or whether their sensitivity is, redu is increased by the fact that there was a first heat wave. And of course, ultimately with heat, you're worried mostly about human health. So we know that social systems can be overdrawn. You can go to the bank too often. So for instance, the uh, European heat wave of 2003, which wasn't, I wouldn't call that a compound event because there were just so many days in a row that were above uh, the, the uh, definition of a heat wave. Uh, but still, you, we could learn some lessons from that, including that the, the morgues were overrun with dead bodies. And they, they were piling them up out in the streets, basically. Uh, that's an example of a social system breaking down. Or, more locally, there's a great study by uh, Van Hollidal on the effect on old buildings in Harlem, right near here, where you have um, less air conditioning, and sometimes none, and a lot of inertia in the fact that they're old masonry buildings. And they did a study of indoor temperature versus outdoor temperature during heat events. And they showed that if you have a hot period and then it cools off outside, that the, uh, the uh, time scale for decay of the heat inside is something like two days. So what happens if you have, have three days of really hot weather outside, then a cool period, and you think the heat wave is over, but then it gets really hot again. As far as the people inside are concerned, you had eight days in a row of heat wave. That's quite a different situation and potentially a life-threatening situation for the people who are living in the building. And we have a lot of that in old cities in the United States. So let's take a look at the question of a compounding then through the lens of identifying compound events from the point of view of social vulnerability. And suddenly you see a much wider spectrum of events that were some of which were in, uh, indirectly pointed to in the previous couple of presentations. For instance, there was the uh, 2017 hurricane season with Irma, Maria, Hurricane Harvey, and a couple of others. Well, I don't know of any work which, you know, Irma and Maria could well have been a blocking situation, so they followed a similar track. Uh, Hurricane Harvey, I don't know of any work that shows that they were physically 
related to each other. So driven by some third compound, uh, some third uh, effect, which is causing them to be compounded. But they certainly were correlated from the point of view of what the social response was. Because of the draining down of FEMA resources, and this is something FEMA itself states in a report, which is publicly available, because of those resources being drained down, they were not able to respond adequately to the aftermath of Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico. Now, there are a lot of other reasons they didn't respond adequately. Political bias, racial bias, I could go on with a very long list. But it's clear that there wasn't enough money to go around once Hurricane Harvey had drowned Houston. The California wildfires, very clear case that the people who were you know, they shared fire jumpers from all over the state, and people just ran out of the ability. But, you know, they, they got tired. Some of them died. They couldn't be there anymore to help the people and the property at risk. So if you looked at wildfires and you looked at the risk of wildfires, you, and you start, you start thinking about compound events in a different way, it doesn't matter that a wildfire might be at one end of the state and another one at the other, and they might or might not be related to each other physically. It doesn't matter that Hurricane Harvey is, I don't know how much, 1,500 miles from Puerto Rico, and that it may or may not, and, and was uh, occurred earlier in the season, and may or may not have been tied in any uh, demonstrable physical way to Hurricane Maria. It doesn't matter because they were linked through the, the political system. To make light of it, you could put Donald Trump in the middle of that picture if you wanted to. So, in fact, when I do this part that I have slides, I'll put them in there. So, you know, clearly there's a whole other world of events which are, will never be demonstrated to be physically driven in their connection, but which are socioeconomically driven. And I think it's very important for us to look at those as well. And to look at how those may change in the future not just because the physical climate will change, as with compound heat waves, which do become more common in the future, but that the social systems themselves will change. And we have control, to a limited degree, on at least the political part of the social system. So that's something where we can turn the knob up or down, maybe even easier than on the greenhouse gas amounts. So I'm not arguing to ignore the physical science, but just that you insist on taking the human perspective in mind, not as the end of all this physical process, but from the beginning, as you start to look at interesting physical processes, it's one way to tell you right away what's interesting. So we're treading on a very rich terrain, as Radley pointed out. Uh, compound events arise out of particular social settings, as well as particular physical settings in which events occur, including policy, and they can be linked at very great distances. Uh, years ago, someone made the point, which Radley, I think, made again about di distant bread baskets, and it's hard to find two failing at once historically, but the probability becomes greater in the future. Yeah, that's a, there's a socioeconomic connection there. If the international trade system is working well, it might not matter so much, but it never works perfectly. And Let's think about system vulnerabilities, sensitivities to one-two punches, no matter where and no matter what distance they occur at, and no matter if they are not very close with each other in time either, compounding still could occur as the world warms. And let me leave you with one last thought, which is I don't know anything about finance and the big macro finance, not any more than anybody here does, but there's a nice analogy which is that one of the reasons for the financial crisis in 2008 was that the people running the Fed, et cetera, didn't understand that there was a risk with all these uh, mortgage instruments being highly leveraged. And that arose because, it, and it was because the national housing market had never suffered a collapse all at once. There had been a collapse here, or a collapse in the West, a collapse in the South, but never more than one at a time. And if you think about compound events this way, this is the kind of surprise that could happen in the future where you start getting things happening that never happened before, and then all of a sudden you're in the financial crisis. 
I don't want to get into the climate version of the financial crisis, please. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to make some uh, remarks that will be very brief and uh, a little bit meta. Um, the first time I ever um, knew I was going to give a talk about compound extremes was a couple of hours ago uh, when uh, Radley and Colin said that somebody canceled, could I do it? Um, but it's even, it's even newer than that. The first time I ever even really knew this was a thing was a few months ago when they came up with the idea for this event. Well, maybe it was a year now. I don't know. Whenever they came up with the idea for this event, at the time I thought, oh, this is uh, – interesting. Somebody should work on this. And then, of course, it turns out there's a whole literature and lots of you already doing it. But um, in reflecting on it, um, it, it occurs to me that it's a, in some ways a really old idea and in other ways a very new one. And um, in trying to think about this, I, I spend a lot of my time uh, studying hurricanes. And so it occurs to me that every hurricane is a compound extreme. They cause um, wind, rain, and storm surge. Um, and some events, one is worse than some events the other, or some there's multiple ones. But there's very little literature on how they're compound. Most of the literature studies one phenomenon or the other, or to the extent that it's both, they're sort of separate. They're, there's no simple way in which they're connected, except through the impacts. And I think that's the important theme. Um, and um, just today, we were... Um, Susanna Camargo, my colleague, and I were having a meeting with uh, some of our research sponsors from Swiss Re who, who have to um, insure against risk of hurricane losses. And they were very interested in the um, question of what causes um, multi season of many, many events. Like we had the most extreme case was 2005 when we had Katrina, Rita Marie, and all of those. So what's the, that's a comp, uh, correlated extreme, right? What's the, what's the chance of having multiple big events in the same basin? And um, there's almost no literature on that either. We spend a lot of time thinking about what controls the number of hurricanes, even that we don't really understand, even in an average sense. But when it comes to the number uh, in a season and what's the probability of having an extreme in the number of extremes, it's a really unexplored topic. So even though the, the importance of it is, is easy, easy to understand, uh, somehow it's new. And I think uh, what's going on here is, in fact, as has already been said by everyone so far, this is a theme that really only makes sense if you think about impacts as being the driving force for it. I mean, there's many, many kinds of compound or correlated or sequential extremes you could have, but there's nothing particularly, unless, unless it's something like the ENSO map that Radley showed, where you have one event that causes all of them, and then you can study that. But in general, the thing that ties them all together is the impacts. And so I think what's going on here and why this is a, a theme now is that is that we're really seeing a move in our field from climate scientists doing what they can figure out how to do, um, whether it's useful or not, to doing things that are meant to be useful. Uh, maybe that's so obvious it doesn't mean to be said, but it's taken me some years to, to grasp it and to be moved by it myself to work in this way. And I think that's true for many of us in this room who have been around a while. Um, we're, we're sort of making that move as, as older uh, scientists from, from Doing, studying what the science tells us from the, way, the motivation that it provides on its own, learning one thing that follows on the next, from taking the question from outside and thinking, well, how can we do something that's relevant? So it's, I think it's great to have this event going on, and the young people coming up who are working on this are going to have already made that um, transition to so-called usable science as it is uh, known um, by the time they uh, you know, are done with their educations. So with those rather uh, scattered and last minute remarks, I will leave it there and leave the rest of the time for questions. So um, thanks to everybody for coming to Columbia and Bradley and Colin for organizing. Okay. okay. Um, so I think my first question is for Sarah first, but for the rest of you as well, which is how do we talk about this stuff? Because for a long time, there's been kind of this narrative that when things get bad enough or things get unambiguous enough, then we'll see mass political action. We'll see a big change, a sea change in our thinking. And finally, we will take action on climate. And that is something that I used to believe. Um, and I think that's probably wrong. 
because I think it's been demonstrated that heat waves in particular meet both of those thresholds. They're very bad and they're very unambiguously due to climate change. So does the opportunity, now that we're talking about correlated extremes, we're talking about it in a different way scientifically, does that provide us an opportunity to change the conversation at all? That's a really in-depth question. Um, I'm not sure if I can answer all of it. I, to be honest, I kind of feel a bit disheartened um, thanks to the latest political situation in Australia where our Conservative government's just been re-elected. So I feel that, yet again, this sort of message is falling on deaf ears. So in some ways, it's, it's you know, talking about it, trying to, and this is what I've tried to demonstrate in my talk, using analogies, trying to make it, people understand at um, something tangible that they can understand does help with com communicating the message. So. It helps in general discussions, but trying to get that message further up the pyramid doesn't seem to be working just yet. So I'm not really sure <coughs> at the moment how to go about that. I'm, yeah, I sometimes think that, yes, we're getting them we're slowly edging that message in there, but perhaps not. First of all, don't give up hope because I think it's a generational thing, basically, and eventually my generation, which screwed it up, will be kicked out, basically, or die, and younger people take over, and they may be inured to the whole thing by then, but I doubt it because it will continue to be surprising and worse, and too late, but still inevitably, I think the problem will be lassoed, tied to the ground, and people will start... and the system will start to respond, but not without a lot of damage. So I by no means would think we should give up on it. <laughs> um, to build on that a little bit, um, you know, you talked a lot about how physics isn't the only thing, and we really need to be looking at impacts, we need to be looking at people. Um, but people are incredibly messy. Um, and I know this because I live in New York City, the capital of messy people. And um, so I was, I was wondering, I wanted to get your take not only on how New York City is vulnerable to correlated extremes like sea level rise, flooding, heat wave, humidity, but also how human behavior shapes and exacerbates or mitigates those in the context of New York. So there are several ways to look at this, but um, let me give you my perspective. Uh, I'm on the New York panel on climate change, which is the advisory group to the city, the technical advisory group. They don't listen to us on policy, on what they should do to build resilience in the context of climate change. And I, my own interests, because my research, my research is focus a lot on sea level rise and defending the city against extreme events, and because I live in New York City, it's personal. So my experience is that uh, under Mayor Bloomberg, uh, there was very focused attention, unusually so, on the, this question. Uh, that. Um, the car, and I'd say that I was not a personal fan of Mayor Bloomberg for other reasons, but in this space, I thought he did a great job. Uh, he left. Uh, the new mayor, who's running for president, has rather less a focus on this issue. Doesn't mean zero. And I, but in, in crying, in talking to my friends in the city bureaucracy, I found out two things. Number one, it's kind of denying neglect where he's allowing things to go on under the radar. Not as much as going on to adapt to the problem as should be. But the bureaucracy, Trump's permanent government or whatever the phrase he uses, is there and pushing this issue so that it's not highlighted. And even though the mayor doesn't care about it or spend any time on it, as far as anybody can see, it's moving along and the plans to do the obvious things at least are getting done. There's a new city code, for instance, which requires when the city invests in or itself builds projects that they have to follow some very stringent guidelines which take care of some of the stupidest things that happen in Hurricane Sandy, like some of our hospitals getting, having the lights go out and all the equipment shut down because the, emer the fuel for the emergency generators is in the basement. The place that's going to get flooded if you're a hospital along the river, 
which six or seven of our hospitals are. Stuff like that. That's getting taken care of. What is not getting taken care of is the long-term stuff. Do we need a surge barrier here? When are we going to decide? What other options do we have? Are we going to get, have to retreat from certain neighborhoods? By the way, the answer is yes on that. Certain neighborhoods are going to be too expensive to defend, and they're not going to be there in 40 or 50 years. You can't do that overnight. You have to start thinking about it now. Very quietly, certain people in the bureaucracy are starting to raise that question. But you're never going to see in public, at least not while well, the mayor has a presidential campaign. I hate to be cynical, but you can almost <coughs> never go wrong being cynical about this issue. So, my bottom, and the other lesson I learned from somebody who used to be very highly placed in the city was that what you really need to get things done is a dedicated revenue stream. And New York City has done that. We just completed something called the Third Water Tunnel. That was planned and uh, over no, more than 50 years, and it was start, they started building it in 1970. The purpose was to be able to shut down the other two water tunnels to, to fix the leaks before they collapsed and the city went without water. It, it, instead of saying, oh, we got to do this tomorrow because there was a disaster, they said, let's think about this in advance, just like you have to do with retreat or hard defenses. <laughs> Our defenses take 30 years to plan and, and complete. And they started it, small, gradual, and they got the thing built. And they got the thing built before the tunnels collapsed. That's what we have to hope for with uh, a, a catastrophe on the climate side. So I think it can be done. It's not easy. But it, it involves not deciding to solve the whole problem at once, and unfortunately, when we have disasters like Hurricane Sandy, all of a sudden there's huge ambition, but then the air goes out of it fairly quickly. So Adam, you've lived through a New York City correlated compound event, and you've studied it. And so I was just curious how experiencing Sandy as not only a researcher, but a human being living through it, how that changed your thinking, if it did at all. Um, yeah, well, I mean, Sandy, was, in some ways, it wasn't the best compound extreme because it was pretty much a surge event. I mean, there were some wind issues knocked out. Some people were killed by falling trees, which is an uh, issue. And they, they were able to close the bridges, but it was mostly a surge event. But, so, I don't know how well it, or maybe I'm missing something. I don't know how well it fits the compound um, extreme uh, format, but it certainly changed my life. I mean, but that was kind of a personal thing. I mean, I ended up public eye in a way that I had never been before, and, and that um, made me realize in a concrete way how um, that the work we do is, uh, matters to people. I mean, I, we always worked that, I always worked that in my grant proposals, but until you see actual humans that aren't um, your colleagues or students uh, showing interest in what you do, it, it, um, it's different when that happens. And so that um, led me to work in a more use-driven or Context that I've been doing, and that I think is the motivation for this whole topic. I mean, that, as I was trying to say at the beginning, I don't, I, I don't think. I mean, extremes as a whole, you could say, is a theme that only makes sense from the point of view of, of impacts. Except there's things like the speed value theory or something that are academic, but basically, the only thing that ties one extreme to another is the impact. Of the same as we're talking about here. So I don't know. That's too different. So you know, you've all talked. <laughs> I mean, you've all talked about um, you know approaching this from the framework of impacts, and that makes sense. But the first thing that that strikes me is impacts on whom, right? Because it is, um, as Radley mentioned, there is this infinite universe of problems that we as scientists can work on. And when we let impacts or stakeholders <laughs> drive our research, it's easy to focus on the loudest voices or the ones that are the best represented. And I was wondering if, if any of you could talk a little bit about how you take that bottom-up approach when you are narrowing that, inner, uh, that infinite universe to sort of specific impacts. Who you're talking to, how you think about these problems, impacts on whom. I try and make it personal. You know, I'm not just a scientist, I'm a citizen, I'm a mum, I pay my taxes. I live in, in a city in, north, in the northwest where the heat waves are quite severe. So to break it down that, you know, we're not just telling you this because we know the information, we think we're better than you. 
it's more that you know th this has an issue and it affects you and I am like you and this is why I'm concerned about this problem. And it's not just, so that, that's one way I try to approach the issue, it's a personal thing and we're all people, but also the things that we live and breathe and enjoy will no longer be there. So another example come from Australia is the Great Barrier Reef. It won't be around if we reach two degrees warming. My grandchildren, should I ever have them, won't be able to experience what I've experienced up there. And you know, that, that, that's that tangible benefit or lack of benefit that they won't be able to have. Also, it's a, it's a huge revenue in Australia to, to bring tourists in. So to put it into key perspectives of this will affect you, it will affect what you know and how you may generate your income, I think helps you know, get that message out there. Yeah, the same thing. I mean, I, and partly because you know, I, I, I changed my career focus over Hurricane Sandy because I used to not worry about impacts in any direct way. But this just caused me to rethink everything because I was stuck with that heat and electricity for a few days and that taught me a lesson. Um, and, and, and let me try to stretch this maybe, but one of the things about looking at heat waves after that and th th this when I talked to physical scientists, one of the things that we discovered, I asked Jane early on to figure out if there was any literature on this business of the temporal structure of heat waves. She says there wasn't any. So that, so I, you know, my challenge, I'm a physical scientist. My challenge to the physical scientists is, why didn't we think about the temporal structure of heat waves? And now it's interesting all of a sudden, and part of the reason it's interesting is because if you look at it through the impacts and you start thinking about what's different about different heat waves with different um, temporal structures. Now I'm sure somebody's gonna, I can see uh, Gavin there, he's thinking he's got some papers maybe you can show me the where they solve the temporal structure problem. But we look pretty carefully and they're very much there. Um, well, very quickly before I open it up to questions, um, I was wondering if each of you in one sentence or two max um, could say, what are we doing wrong? Um, what are we as physical scientists, as climate scientists, what are we missing? What could we do better? And basically, why are you here? I need to think about this. <laughs> what are we doing wrong? I guess. Let's, I'm going to start with what we're doing wrong. I think we're doing something that's cutting edge, that's interesting, that's meaningful. When you know, we're not the people here, especially. We're not trying to stay in our glass towers and do research because it excites us. We're doing it because it also benefits people in the outside world. So I think that's what we're doing right. It's how we're getting the message out there and making people listen that we may not be doing as effectively as what we'd like. I think naturally scientists don't want to, they either you know, don't want to communicate or aren't trained to communicate properly. So it's trying to bridge that gap, I think, that we're not yet being successful. Um, I don't know how to change that, but I think that's, that's where we're missing. Yeah, let me pick up on that. I, I think first of all, we should, I think scientists should worry um, so much about themselves being great communicators. I think intermediaries are more important. You're never gonna get most scientists terrific communicators. You are, you're, you are, you are, but in general, it's fairly hard. <laughs> and you are. And everybody is. <laughs> uh, it's hard, and, and with the selection, they become a scientist, biases us against that. So look for people to communicate your message for you and help them get it right. Just so I understand the question, can you say what we're doing wrong? You mean about Solving a problem in the world, as a, or no, as I mean vis-a-vis -vis understanding compound extremes or correlated extremes. <laughs> well, good, because that's a great lead-in. Because now I want you guys to tell us, who are mostly physical scientists up here, what are we doing wrong? I want to hear from from people in other communities, or maybe what are we doing right? How can we bring together scientists and people with other expertise, with other disciplines? How can we make progress on identifying the problems and really using the sort of bottom-up framework for, for making progress? Which is a long-winded way of saying I'm opening it up for questions. So my and I you said you didn't want to talk about the analog climate so, you know, that's really 
the I might argue we're already there. And there are a lot of your, your uh, statements about Harvey and Marie are, are, are quite true. They impact the one that works. But both are connected to climate change. There are multiple papers about each of these storms showing that the amount of precipitation is considerably larger than climate change. You know, maybe this is something we really do need to talk about. Fire in California, and not or anywhere else. What more can our system pay without avoiding some kind of significant? No, I, I completely agree. I just I, there's a limit to how far I'll talk about the financial system because I'm not an expert. That's just that's the only comment. The analogy is that we had these new uh, instruments, financial instruments, which help the risk supposedly be spread, but instead it caused the risk to be highly correlated. And the analogy is so what's uh, increased greenhouse forcing doing to various parts of the system that don't look like they're well correlated now, but could wind up very well correlated in the future. And that could be disastrous. That's as far as I want to take the handle. Thank you. Fair enough. So this actually this gets back, uh, I have an answer that gets back to uh, the answer your question that I passed on, which was about what's going on. You know, why has all this stuff not changed people's perception? I mean, I think we as scientists have for sometimes sense that response is irrational because so much is already happening and yet uh, there doesn't seem to be a, a massive change of, of consciousness about it, but the change when it comes to it seem equally irrational. I mean, so the, 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 what the really correlated extreme will be when uh, this relates to the financial crisis too, it could end up looking very similar. I mean, imagine you have a little bit more sea level rise and a couple more bad hurricanes or some just kind of storms in the U.S. East Coast, you could get a couple more events where a lot of people get flooded. And at some point, whether attributes of studies show it or just even if they're not there, even if it's just popular consciousness, people decide that it's, it's too much. The coastal real estate isn't worth what we think it is, and the market could crash, right? It doesn't have to be it doesn't have to be directly a consequence of the physical events. It doesn't have to be all it means is that people's minds have to shift and the market is market and it moves uh, it moves very fast when it moves as we saw in 2008. It's not so much Stuff losing value as people thinking that it's losing value, and then it does. Right? It's a circular problem. So, I mean, that's something like that, I think, could be what finally does it. And what's more correlated to stream than sea level rise? You know, so, that's, the one that, that's the one. I don't know when that's going to happen, but I, I think at some, at some point it will. More questions? system is already bankrupt and they can keep shoveling money into it but there's a limit to how much money can go. And it could be we'd be lucky in this 10 or 20 or 30 years where things don't come together either because they're really correlated or just accidentally. Uh, but one of these days we're getting a cloud of financial So I want to pick up on this theme of, of climate gentrification and, and go back to this earlier question that I asked. Um, and, and maybe I phrased it poorly, but what I want to know is, isn't there a danger when we are, when we are working in the impact space of overemphasizing the impacts on vacation homes in Fire Island and underemphasizing the impacts on marginalized communities? How do we make sure that we're not doing that? <laughs> well, it won't happen without a conscious choice to do it. I mean, the, the, it, you're absolutely right, Kate. I mean, if you look at the literature, I'm not an expert as much as many people are in this room, I'm sure, but if you look at the literature on damages from 
depends. It's mostly measurement dollars, and most damage, damage measurement dollars happens to people that have most dollars. It's, it's built into how we think about it, and it's um, it's a lot harder to measure other kinds of damage. Because people are measuring those dollars counts to where you can see them. Um, so uh, I, I think it's a terribly important question. There's no simple answer except it takes time. Uh, you know, I spent a lot of time with IPCC and have for decades now. And one of it's, it's you know, it, it's, a, it's sort of a UN agency. Where the agencies are always criticized for uh, trying to be politically correct and uh, spread the goodies around and uh, not worry about serious business. But in fact, one of the effects of having to be answerable to 195 countries is that those reports, they try to be balanced between the impacts as measured in dollars and impacts as measured as determined by other metrics, like numbers of dead bodies. And if you look at heat waves, far more people die in a place like India when the heat waves are uh, than die in the United States or Australia. And uh, I think actually the scientific community, viewed through that lens, is doing a pretty good job of keeping things balance. Um, there's, there's never been, in my experience, there hasn't been in, 20, in about 25 years uh, a fight over uh, monetizing things and only monetizing things since the, an IPCC uh, report almost fell apart over the issue of value of human life, where evaluation for uh, the global norm is not put was, you know, 20 times what the valuation was for an individual in the South. And that fight was fought and basically won by people who don't want to talk about only dollar values. So I, I personally worry a little less about that. We should all, as Adam said, we have been milling in our heads when we talk about this. We should balance things. But the other side of that is you have to, there's no use talking to audiences who aren't going to listen to you. And there's a certain amount of necessity audience that's in front of you, and that very frequently means, you know, talking in terms they understand, and that does, doesn't always lead to a valid presentation, no matter how hard you try. Questions from the audience? Yeah, Marco. Certainly my experience talking about the social impacts of heat waves, for example, is much more effective when, you know, t talking to the media, absolutely. You know, they're not really interested in what's driving them and the climate change thing has been said again. But if you say, look, this is going to affect you, this is going to affect whether it's your power bill, how your grass is going to grow, your health, your access to resources, that's certainly more effective in communi communicating to a general audience as well. They also seem, and I think this is kind of echoing what Mike was saying, is, it's some. I, I, I tend to think that it's, in, uh, it's somewhat more selfish in look, talking to the general population. They're not necessarily as interested in what's happening in more marginalised populations, which is really unfair and 
really unfortunate. Um, so that's certainly something that we, we need to work on, whether it's in, as scientists or as communicators are working together. Can, can you be quick? I can actually have a question. Oh, really? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so how does knowledge about the correlation of, of extremes, and you mentioned Miami, and the correlation between house prices, income for the city, the ability to do due diligence, all the investment, how, do, how does that actually help places, people, institutions become more resilient? Does Please. it, can it? Please answer in 30 seconds. Yes. <laughs> You know, I mean, if we, an episode like uh, the Harvey Maria relationship that I outlined in a, a more sensible world, which we are not in right now, uh, would be one piece of evidence which would lead to uh, a, a stronger coastal, um, a stronger system for not just financing disaster relief, but for putting some of that money towards building resilience in advance. I mean, these things wouldn't even be so much a problem, at least currently, if the federal government gave one penny for spent, instead of spending on disaster relief, spend it in advance so that communities could be stronger in this regard. It's only in the context of Sandy that there was some money dedicated for resilience building expecting the next storm. So that's just one example of how you could have a more sensible view. Our a disaster, our flood insurance program is a disaster. It's it's built so as to encourage the wrong behavior. All right. With that, um, I think we have a lot of good points to guide discussions for the next couple of days, and I want to turn it over to Colin, who's going to tell you about the booze. Oh. <laughs> yeah, this um, outside, so. We'll go enjoy it, and there's some food and stuff too. So, uh, yeah, we'll thank the panel once again for their 